<laughs> Welcome back, Tisha. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Alex McKay. I'm um, VP of Programs and Interactive Grants for Rasmussen Foundation, which is a place-based funder located in Alaska. Uh, this session, Investing in Artists and Culture Bearers, is part of the Arts, Culture, and Creative Economies track. It was put together by the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. Um, we're really grateful for that and excited to share some of the artist work and investment and in processes versus products. I think people often think about um, creativity and arts in terms of the product, but really there's a process and infrastructure that really um, is behind it all. Um, what I'd like to do um, is before we really launch, I, you know, I think that we really hope that what you get out of this session is to know that there's much more to the artistic process than what, what meets your eye. Um, like with any industry or project, there's an infrastructure um, that, that needs to support the work. And sometimes this infrastructure is really invisible. You know, we think of as funders infrastructure as being, um, you know, mortar, bricks, wood, but really it's made up of people and ideas. And so I think that in this area in particular, there are ideas that you'll really um, hear how they started, um, how they've evolved from ideas into what might just look like a product um, and what inspires them to move, move it out into something that's a pathway for others and really inspirational and really foundational for communities. Uh, what I'd like to do is to ask um, each of our, uh, um, our presenters um, and who we have is um, Kwachung, Stephen Blanchett, um, Ingvil Gutu, Tisha Creer, Zakia Harris um, here with us. And I'm asking each of them if they could introduce themselves and I'll start with um, Kwachung. Hey, Kuyana. Yeah, hello, my name is Kachung, um, also known as Steve Blanchett. Um, I'm calling in from Juneau, Alaska, the uh, traditional homelands of the, the Sinket um, people. And uh, I am originally uh, from the southwestern part of Alaska in a community called Mount Reisuk. Um, and uh, I'm Yupik and Black. I'm a musician, um, primarily. I'm also a cultural educator. Um, and I currently, uh, you know, it, on top of performing and, and performing in my band, Bomiwa, I, I work as a, the art education director at the Juno Arts Humanities Council and, uh, you know, just do a lot of advocacy for, um, for the arts and for, the, for music and for culture um, on things like uh, being on the board of the Western Arts Alliance, um, where I chair programs such as, you know, um, advancing indigenous performance and black arts at WA. So uh, yeah, that's just a little bit about me. Uh, Poyana, uh, for joining us. Thank you. Um, and then I'd like to go to um, Tisha, and if you could introduce yourself. Greetings, everyone. My name is Tisha Creer, and I am talking to you right now from the middle of my juice bar in South Oak Cliff, Dallas, Texas, uh, where I have been um, born and raised. Uh, I spent a lot of my life, I'm a theater baby. I spent a lot of my life doing uh, uh, arts administration as well, uh, working for the city and uh, working all over this town in various capacities. A few years ago, we started a, a company called Susu Cultural Business Incubator as a way to uh, support and uh, uh, stimulate the local creative and cultural economy by supporting uh, local creatives and uh, it was the hopes of um, uh, creating a, a, a cultural business hub or acquiring property so that we have space to do the beautiful things that we do. Uh, so we did a, a series of pop-up markets for a couple of years in vacant lots throughout our, our town and we uh, four years ago, acquired a this property that we're on right now through a non-traditional uh, loan from a family foundation. And uh, we are looking to uh, acquire more properties so that we can do uh, house even more creatives to do even greater work. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Tisha. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to Ingvil to introduce yourself and your work. Yeah, hi, thank you so much. My name is Yngvil Vattengustu. Uh, that name is 100% Norwegian and I am 75% Norwegian, 25% Swede. Extremely 
Caucasian and a happy Alaskan dweller since 2002. Um, when I came kind of with the circus up to um, Alaska and he, after three days decided to stay. And uh, I haven't really ever regretted that or been close to even be bored with that for a single moment. I uh, quickly got involved with the uh, arts and culture in uh, the local area, which after having been on the road with music and theater companies for more than a decade, it was very nice to, lovely to find a community that I could be part of and kind of thrive in and help contribute to. Uh, in short, what I'm doing as to contribute and to thrive now is to run a nonprofit organization called Northern Culture Exchange. And that uh, organization has been uh, in existence for about eight years. It's an umbrella for a lot of different uh, initiatives uh, and projects uh, run by people who want to do stuff without necessarily running an organization. And so we help each other. We share information. We share financing uh, opportunities and we share bookkeeping and all of that kind of stuff. And uh, we are spread over a large area of um, of arts uh, genres, but primarily we're focusing on music right now. And we're also even portioning off a, a kind of music part of what we do into a second nonprofit called Music Alaska. So those two things, um, uh, maybe that's enough for now. I'll maybe just say that we, what we actually run is a music festival, an annual music summit, uh, an under 21 open mic, uh, a, a performance series, and uh, a kind of advocacy and professional development initiative for musicians. Thank you, Ingo. Uh, and then I'd like to um, finish the introductions with Zakia Harris. Hi, everyone. It's my honor to be here with you all today. Um, as you heard, my name is Zakia Harris. I'm the granddaughter of Evelyn Light and Mary Jane Rose by way of Richmond, Virginia, currently residing in my hometown where I've lived since I was two years old of the beautiful Oakland, California. I consider myself to be a cultural architect working at the intersections of art. I am a performance artist, singer, dancer. I do theater work myself. Um, I'm also all about personal transformation. And I do that work as a life coach. And I'm also a spiritual entrepreneur. Currently, I'm overseeing a project throughout Alameda County that's really focused on Oakland as the epicenter called Arts Web. And so we have created a Black and BIPOC, but really centering black, the Black-led creative cultural ecosystem. Um, in the words of one of my dear sisters, Ashara Ekundayo, really speaking to the fact that many times Black artists are art as first responders. They are the first responders in the streets, moving the conversation not only about what it looks like to lift up the creativity of a city, but also what it looks like to advance equity and social justice. And we all know that Oakland has always been traditionally a hub for that. And for that reason, we want to make sure that because of this economic pause that we've all received, that we are centering the Black-led cultural creative ecosystem and they have an opportunity to tremendously benefit and restore um, the historic marginalization and um, disenfranchisement of those communities. And so that's why we are working specifically around the strategies of real estate acquisition, um, black led cooperative structures, as well as um, oh, uh, integrated capacity building as a different form of capacity building. I also want to acknowledge that we are on stolen land. We are on Ohlone land and Ohlone territory. So we're also grappling with the realities of what it looks like to trade and market and sell and exchange land that has been stolen. And so that's definitely something that we've been in discussions about and really thinking about how to be, um, to restore, be inclusive, and to acknowledge that history as well. So thank you for having me. Great. Um, even though I'm prepared, uh, you know, with for all of you artists, when you hear all of your stories together, I'm just so impressed. So it's, it's really exciting um, how much work and influence all of you have. I just want to acknowledge that. So. To get into the meat of the conversation today, I, I think I want to, I'm going to lead off with um, Tisha. And I think that you're hearing what each of these artists do, and then you're hearing sort of the, the kind of amazing extensive things that they're doing for the community. But what I'd like to know is, um, 
sort of what inspired you to do this? Um, kind of what what does this work mean to you in, in terms of the community, um, at least at the beginning? Well, it's so many layers to it, but you know, this particular project that we're, that I'm working on right now, it comes, it stems. The inspiration comes from the fact that there is no fresh food. There's no fresh food in my neighborhood and uh, I'm, I'm hungry. So uh, we, created, we created a space so that we could get food. And then in addition to that, um, you know, honoring, you know, the cultural root of our food and transforming it into the healthiest version possible brings a lot of stories and a lot of connections. So that was the, the, you know, the first inspiration for this. And, you know, just the fact that, you know, I'm watching my entire um, neighborhood uh, uh, on top of the vacant lots uh, as we go into developing these areas, we're not included in the, in the voice, in the, in the development. And so, you know, it was just to, to show that, you know, locally led responsible property development is probably the most innovative thing that you can do, you know? Um, and so um, that was the, the inspiration for that part is to be able to capture uh, some of this land that is here. Um, because as I started, you know, I, I, like I said, I grew up, I came up as an artist. And, and when I started doing uh, teaching artists and arts administration work, I started to look at the landscape of the, uh, of the city and I started to see how much um, systemic racism is just so deeply involved in our urban planning. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I just wanted to look at ways that we could uh, capture land. And like Sister Zakia uh, was mentioning, uh, you know, looking at uh, economic structures, they're new economic structures, but they're old ec economic structures. That's why I call it SUSU, you know, and it's this idea of, of working in a circle and, and getting out what you put in. You know, capitalism always wants a percentage of cut of tax, mm -hmm. but there is value in working in a circle and getting out what you put in. So these are the basic tenets of my inspiration. Yeah, and I'm struck in the conversations we've had um, that you are part of, this is the community you grew up in, I believe. Is that right? It is. It is. Oh, and mm. I think that as um, investors or funders, uh, sometimes we come in with ideas. There's a great idea that works in another community and we want to spread that idea and kind of fund that idea and kind of bring it to a community. Um, but it, it seems that the approach you're taking is you're from the community and you saw a need in terms of the food that you couldn't get and the fresh food that's often not available in marginalized neighborhoods. And um, could you talk a little more about how you expanded from your your juice bar um, and, and a creating healthy food for the community into these sort of pop-up stores and real estate. Um, you know, what inspired you to do that? Because that's really going a step beyond. Yeah, it kind of went the other way around. Uh, it's like one of my colleagues that people know in here, Clyde says, you know, uh, people, a lot of times when funders come in, they want a feasibility study. And uh, with people who live in the neighborhood, we are the feasibility study. We are the study. We know what we need. We know what's missing. And a lot of times we've, uh, you know, uh, erected creative ways to to make to make that even uh, happen. So what happened was is, um, uh, I, you know, there's this whole body of, of uh, people that are creative, cr making creative things, making products, uh, and not just products, but serving the community in their in their creative and cultural way being the culture bearers and so uh, um, and then i was looking at all the vacant lots mm -hmm. so it's like well let's take what we do put it together and pop them up in these lots and you know serve our people right there as well as proving the economic viability uh of, of how these vacant spaces uh can basically make money <laughs> In addition to serving, I know it's not all about money, and I know sometimes when we start to talk about money, it starts to feel like it's the evil thing. Like if you connect your art and your culture to making money, then suddenly it's like you're selling out. But you know, I think that that's a big part of you know the things that I work with inside of my community is us getting over that leap mm -hmm. and realizing that you can be righteous and be economically sound. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so it was about like 
showing that inside of all of these vacant uh, spaces. And uh, to be honest with you, I wasn't necessarily going to start with the food, but uh, we decided to focus on this one mile strip of land about five minutes away from downtown. And this first place that we were able to acquire is just a small little space that you see me in now. Mm -hmm. uh, and it said food. It said food. So we listened to it. And that's what we erected. We have a body of, of, of concepts and businesses that can go depending on what the space calls for. Mm -hmm. So, so you, and then also just inside of there, we did a, a we you know like I said it's called Susu. So we did a lot of like Susu circles and economic exchange just to kind of practice that arm of um, of, sh of sh collective work and collective responsibility. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have to do a community survey or a feasibility study mm -hmm. or value <laughs> because you as you said you you are the community. So. Yeah, the survey happens on the porch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's great. Or, or, you know, or at the church or, you know, or whatever. <laughs> That's the survey. Right, you're always in survey. Um, yeah. So um, I'm going to turn, thank you for that. I'm going to turn it over to um, Kwa Chung to talk about your work. And I, I know I'm familiar with your band, and wonderful band, really fun. But it's more than that. You know, there's there's more that really brought you to the music and what you do. And I wonder if you could talk about <clears throat> kind of marrying your culture, the Black and Yupik culture, and sort of the language and cultural elements, and what, what inspired you? Yeah, sure. Guiana, uh, um, yeah, that really, I want to say uh, first, you know, to Zakia, thank you for, um, you know, bringing to light, the, you know, stolen land and, and having that question of how to do transit, transaction on that. You know, I'm still on my homelands, and, and, um, but if, I think about it, you know, I've th th thought about this many times, like for those of us, you know, for many people, if they want to learn about their culture, about their history and about their ways and their practices and um, their heritage, they have places to go back to. Uh, you can go back to Europe or um, and, and all these places around the world. But, you know, if we start to lose our culture, our languages and, and those heritages, we don't have a place to go back. I can't, there's no place for me to go back to or our people to go back to. So. Um, and that, you know, that real, that knowledge uh, and of, of that uh, is, it weighs very, very heavily on, us, especially indigenous peoples here in, 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 you know, in the Americas, Alaska. Um, but, uh, you know, so, you know, I, in my lifetime, um, you know, I grew up speaking my traditional language, it was my first language. Um, and so it's a huge part of, of our identity and who we are. Um, and when I was young, uh, we had a many, I mean, a large, we, it, the Yupik language is, is right now currently, you know, second behind Navajo as the most uh, widely spoken indigenous language um, in, in North America. And so when, when I started, when we started seeing this, our languages start to, to kind of slip away um, from about 90% of our people spoke our language when I was a child, when I was born. Uh, and in my lifetime, we have seen that dip below 50%. Um, and that was, it's just devastating. Um, we have seen languages um, in, um, in my home state. Uh, we have 22, diff 22 different uh, traditional languages um, and, and like main languages that, you know, that doesn't even, you know, uh, I'm not counting the, the dialects uh, uh, we've seen uh, a couple of them and just in the last 15 years that have gone extinct. And it's devastating to community. Um, it's devastating to, to on, on so many levels um, because the language is just, just a part of it. So my music, you know, we sing, it's very intentional that we sing in our traditional language, in our traditional um, mother tongue. It's an Inuit language, part of the Inuit language family. Uh, but uh the dancing traditional dancing is also a big part of our performance and so so this this performance of dance and music in our language that's just that's a huge part of it right and um and each one of those elements really um interlink in so many ways so uh let's just take dancing for traditional dancing for instance so with the dances you need you need drums like the one behind me 
uh, artists that paint on these drums, uh, our dance regalia, which is our dance fans, uh, our headdresses, our gusbucks, our viluhooks, which are our, our boots, many people call them mukluks, um, uh, the drumsticks. I mean, all these just layers and layers and layers of knowledge and, and history. And that's just with one element of our culture. So th these are things that we're fighting for. This, you know, we are on, you know, we're, we're fighting to keep our culture from becoming extinct. Um, it's endangered. All of our languages back here in home uh, are endangered. You know, I'm here on Thinket land uh, down in Southeast Alaska, and there's just a couple thousand people of the Thinket people that speak the language, you know? Um, and that's just general, it's just, it's so close to losing so much of, of who we are. So that was kind of the impetus, you know, when my brother and I and Asi and Karina and Christopher, uh, you know, this core of our group, when we decided to uh, embark on this idea of, of, of um, utilizing our culture in, to make a, a statement and a career in, in music. Thank you, Kuchung. I think, I mean, that's wonderful, just sort of tying all of that together. So community and culture is just really part of everything that you do. Um, mm. But you, and I know that it's gone beyond that practice, um, just from knowing you and knowing um, the work that you do. And could you talk a little bit about how you've engaged kind of the broader community um, and how you're kind of laying the path forward or, or what I would say is starting to lay the path for others? Um, that, that's not often what um, a business does, let's say. Uh, you know, you can invest in a business and you're just doing your business. And um, there, are, there are extra pieces that all of you are doing that, that are not monetary. Um, and there, again, I, I agree, there's nothing wrong with money. It's really what you do with it. But um, could you talk about that and how you've expanded um, what you do to include others? Yeah, oh man. You know, doing this, being in this life um, and being a part of this, what I see is not, you know, just as a movement, um, that's that's really the, it's not about the money or anything like that. I mean, I don't, I don't hardly make any money off of it. We just, I mean, but we still continue uh, to do this. Um, because you know we're we're warriors, you know, we're warriors, and and we see other warriors out there. You know when we started, it, we're, we're about 25, 26 years that we've been um, together uh, as Bummiwa, and what we kind of in the beginning, you know, when we started this, we were we were seeing we were we wanted to bring bring people with us, right? We wanted to to pull pull this this. Uh, I guess in a way we were talking about it yesterday a little bit because you know we're in Alaska and talk about the snow we have to break trail right because you know the person in the front is just really struggling struggling to break through that snow and and that deep snow it's just it's a struggle but you just keep going and uh, and those that come behind you on those trails have an easier time uh, you know and the more and more and more people that you have then you have a, I mean a well a well uh, well take a well um, traveled trail. Um, even on the ice and snow. Uh, and so, uh, you know, lately, in the, I'd say in the last um, five, six years, we've been seeing uh, a lot of young um, indigenous artists, artists like Byron Nikolai, artists like Arius Hoyle, uh, who are also performing and singing in their own languages. Uh, we're, we're trying to uplift them as much as possible. So when we can, we take them with us on the road uh, and, and on a show. Uh, throw them onto a track on, you know, I have uh, young Arius and uh, on a couple of my tracks on my new album. Um, and so we just really, we're trying to like uplift, uplift those. Cause that's the way it is that, that we, we do this, right? We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for our ancestors um, that, you know, continue to sing the songs, to continue to drum and dance and to teach us those ways. Um, my mom, um, Aranak Marie Mead. She was. She's a huge uh, reason why we're we're doing this. You know, she's a traditional dancer her, her, herself, and and um, and she didn't. She 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 really uh, was. You know, she is that uh, one of the reasons why we continue to do what we do um, because you know she she for us um, having an elder. You know, 
like that. I see her now as an elder, right? She was just my mom, my mom for so long. But, you know, she's there trying to do the same thing. She teaches language, you know, every day she's fighting for these things to keep our languages alive, our dances and our songs. So we carry on that legacy of, you know, of those that come before us so that those after us will be able to continue this as well. Beautiful. I, I mean, I think for people who are funders and they're thinking about infrastructure, you know, you try to think about, you know, how solid is it? Is it sustainable? But it seems to me that in the creative process, if it's the passion that drives you, <clears throat> sustainability is built on it because there's a recognition of who came before you who shoulders you stand on, I think, in a lot of cultures or in music or creative areas. And then this idea of bringing people along. So, so the work and the infrastructure is already there. The investment is um, the passion. And then the funders are really just coming to add some fuel to that. Um, that that's wonderful. I, I want to turn it over to Ingville, um, who I know also has, um, you know, there are things that we all draw upon, um, whether it's, you know, I know in your family, there's a, there's a strong musical um, tradition. And um, that's really driven your passion for music and theater and performance and communication. And um, luckily for Alaska, you brought it up here. Could you talk a little bit about that passion? And um, maybe then we'll go into uh, a little bit about the sort of infrastructure that you've been building so that others can really come forward. I mean, you, you supported me so that I can come forward a little bit more with um, arts that I, that I love. Um, anyway, I'd like to turn it over to you to answer that. Ooh, yeah, so thank you. Um, when I, oh, so passion, I want to also mention the other side of my family, which is language. So I learned to read very early from my dad, who is kind of, you could say the keeper of the traditional language in Norway. He's the editor of the main dictionary of the Norwegian language. So language has always been a very important part of, of, uh, of our family. What's kind of really ironic in a way is it, uh, the the experience I had as as a younger person was being a part of a minority language which had been the ruling language so there's like I have seen in just in my little lifetime not that old uh, things sort of be overturned and politically things move in this way and that way and not just politically but people's actual conception of history and what truth is moves uh, you know faster and faster these days, but has this something that what reality really is and the value of where you come from, what you represent and a culture which is threatened or one that's on the move, it, it, can, it can be a subjective uh, experience and it can be changing. Hopefully for all of us and everyone we work with, it will change positively. Um, and so I think that the the thing that made me settle in Alaska, which has been kind of the root of the work that I have been fortunate to be allowed to do, because I'm kind of a self-taught organizer. Uh, my background was in theater and in music, uh, obviously, and also sort of just academia. Um, uh, then coming to a place that I suddenly felt like there's there's a need for some Ingville here. I remember sort of saying that there's like this place could do with some Ingville, and I didn't even know what that meant. I just felt totally sort of like welcome to contribute, and and that has been the thing that has kind of warmed my heart. That there was very few questions about well, who are you? Where do you come from? What do you you know? None of that, which actually I experienced when I go back it's more complex to go to a place where you were born and where you grew up because there's so many layers so in one way i kind of honor and have huge humility for people who are working in their home place because for me that's actually more psychologically complex i feel like i have more freedom to contribute and that's really what i i i want for myself if i was going to take anything it's the satisfaction of having done something for other people i think that's a very human uh, human um, trait in all of us. There's nothing special for me or uh, you know, that's just what I was looking for. And I therefore believe, I, I think I learned at some university course that, you know, that the, 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 what's, what's very strongly personal is typically also universal. So your personal, individually, deeply experienced truth, you can be pretty sure that you are not living among Martians. So there are humans on this earth and we all sort of share that and you'll be able able to communicate. So as a performer, I have been always seeking 
truth and some that could allow me the moments on stage or in other uh, performance situations a, a real true connection with people because it, it makes me feel whole and I think that is what translates into the community work and the discovery the continual discovery of of what all these different things mean to put together organizations framework infrastructure and so on and so I started a festival because I needed friends you know like Tisha once said where's the food and I'm like where are the musicians so in a way, I started playing with some people and we formed this jazz festival, which is now 14 years old, uh, uh, in, a, in a juice bar <laughs> um, with the smoothies. Uh, and we were all sitting there going, you know, yeah, that was cool. You write music. And I looked around and every, everybody here writes music. We all have an hour's material. What if we started a festival? And we did. And it was just this kind of crazy one day, hot and sweaty, believe it or not, Alaskan summer uh, evening. And and now, 14 years later, there's a lot of a lot of evolved and the nonprofit came out of the need everything's organically kind of happening out of the need to to fund it and to have more control over the organization of that we had fiscal partners we learned what we could do bit by bit uh, we've also never really done a feasibility study we we do we do our we do our our work based on listening it's kind of listening to the ground and and then building trust and that was what i was going to say uh, decided i was going to say today that i think that my my main interest is to build uh, my drive personal drive is to build connections and build trust between different players and be they different artists because artists can be so possessive about their capital which is their idea they think they're the one that has this like okay now here's my juice bar you know here's my band and i'm not going to share my recipe or share my chords with you and it just seems like you know it would be better if everybody in a small place like anchorage alaska or other cities uh you know would would know about each other and and work and share and i i do you think that I've played some part in making that kind of a, uh, at least an option, a viable option for people in the community? Uh, and and uh, those those paths that we, those trails that we blaze, they can be blown back again. So we have to kind of keep, we have to make sure that there's enough people continually that follow us or go with us or, or, or teach us things, because we may actually be on the slightly less optimal direction to our goal. Um, so I do think that there's this whole um, uh, sort of, uh, yeah, path, path to what is your personal truth and trying to be authentic uh, and uh, stand by that and not be too distracted from it and kind of do things that the community needs and that that you it's, and be honest about this is what I think the community needs. Like I could be wrong, so it's kind of in, an open invitation to people to to share their best. And I always ask people who want to work with me. This is my last thing. What do you like doing? What what would what is it that you would like to contribute? Um, and then they get a chance to start from their point uh, of truth, and hopefully that takes away a lot of worries on everybody's part that they've been allowed to come in to a place as who they are. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you, Ingvil. And I think that um, people are starting to hear there's a theme and there's a reason why this is the panel. You know, I think that the, there is this understanding of community, which I think, um, you know, social capital investors are trying to invest in or how to strengthen um, communities or people. But it really starts from your own culture and your own drive and passion and being true to that. And then finding your community or, or living in your community and listening to each other and being the decision makers. Uh, and I think that I know for me personally as a funder, that's really important to think of. Um, and that you see, you know, I'm in a very linear business um, of funding um, with evaluations and feasibility studies and dashboards and outcomes. Um, but, but that really some of the best work that can be sustained really is organic and um, comes out of the needs that the community recognizes, whatever community that is, a music community the Dallas community teacher works in, whether it's a cultural community. Um, and so I'd like to turn it over to Zakia, um, and maybe you could answer this as well. Sort of, we know that there's a vast array of things that you do. You're a performer in many ways, but you're also sort of a, 
a kind of a life coach and, and, and person that inspires things and an art architect of all kinds of creativity. But could you kind of go back to sort of the source and sort of share that with us and sort of what motivated you to get into the, the work that you just want to say jazz hands echoing everything that's already been said on the call. Um, you know, and I, I'm a, a child of the African diaspora. I practice um, indigenous African spiritual traditions, specifically Ifa. And so in our tradition, we believe that your destiny um, is something that you come into this incarnation of this body with. In many ways, you chose it in the heavenly realm and your, um, your opportunity in this earth and in this realm, realm is to really remember, remember yourself. And so in that sense, I feel like this practice chose me. It's not something that I definitely chose. I was on uh, I was on a linear checkbox uh, lifestyle of going to college, getting a degree. I did two years of law school, doing all of the things that I was told to do because I was told to look outside of myself um, for my redemption rather than looking at who I was, what are the gifts and the special sauce that I actually bring and how can I bring my gifts to the world and how can I use education to really refine that. So I went through a major kind of uh, transformation in my own life over 20 years ago where I really had my whole life kind of turn upside down and I made a commitment that I was going to stop compartmentalizing my work, stop compartmentalizing my life. I'm not going to be an artist in one room and then show up with my my spiritual community in a different way and then show up at my job and be a different person that I was going to show up integrated and, and show up full. And I think as that relates to my arts practice, that's essentially what the call I have heard from um, everyone on this call as well as cultural creatives around the country and around the world. Um, you know, I watched Oakland go from a place of shelter in place where our downtown corridor was completely um, uh, vacant and, and empty. And, and then it went through racial uprisings where it was completely destroyed. Then um, that destruction was then put up a bunch of uh, boards. It was boarded up. And all of those boards, artists descended upon and made some of the most beautiful protest art murals um, that have kind of gone viral. And so we see um, this constant relationship between arts, artists showing up and kind of moving these conversations of social change. We see these conversations of things being integrated, artists wanting to be able to really um, uh, hack the nonprofit industrial complex, hack the traditional models of finance and banking, um, which have been historically racist and, and, and supremacist. And so people, to the point of so many on the call, they're not looking for another study. They don't need another map. They don't need another research paper. They don't need another advice advisory board, everyone in their community is the own experts of their story. And so what I'm seeing in Oakland and, and I think across this call and across the world right now is a deep, deep sense of accelerated collaboration where people are coming together and people already were doing that. But because of this moment and because of this urgency of this moment, I think there's definitely been an acceleration of collaboration and people saying, but we don't want to go and just recreate the same systems that we've created. So yes, we want to acquire land because we know land is um, about maintaining place, but we also want to acknowledge the people who this land were stolen from. Yes, we want to build our organizational capacity, but we don't need to all go out and hire our own CFOs, our own marketing and communication strategists, our own grant writers. How can we share those resources? How can we share the pool? You know, I think uh, the philanthropic community has been very generous in many ways because of COVID, because of the racial uprisings, but it's still maintaining a status quo system of what true liberation looks like. You know, um, single year funding, funding that is not multi-year um, forces very small organizations who already are already working with maybe one, two, maybe three full-time staff if they're lucky um, to have to figure out how they're going to manage these funds, but it's only a single year, so they can't go out and hire anybody. Um, they're also become complete rapid response agencies for the communities that they already were serving. Serving. So they're supporting them with COVID relief, supporting them with, with navigating these times of uncertainty and building the bike as they ride it at the same time. And so I think that 
we all agree we need to kind of take a step back and truly use this um, wake up call that Earth Mother Onile has given us all. We've, been, we've received the gift of this global pause button, this gift of this opportunity to take a step back and truly reimagine systems that are required. And so as people of color and BIPOC and black led and indigenous communities are organizing. We also need our white, and I don't use the word ally, I use the word co-conspirator. We need people who are ready to um, go to town with us and, and get locked up with us and hold themselves on the line with us, our white co-conspirator communities to really support us and what that those leverage points are to support us in reimagining um, those kind of historically racist institutions specifically banking and real estate. Um, one thing I'll share around that and what that looks like for our work in Alameda County as well as Santa Clara County is we are looking at new forms of metrics. Um, one of the evaluation systems that we brought in is called the Community Cultural Wealth Framework. Um, this is a framework that looks at non-financial metrics as an opportunity to demonstrate wealth, to demonstrate the currencies that every community already has, currencies such as creativity, currencies such as agility, currencies such as collaboration, um, being able to, to navigate and to, and to move forward in the midst of all these things. How can we document that? How can we put that on a value statement? How can we put that on a financial statement and be able to truly take it to the bank and also know that as we're taking it to the bank, we're not interested in the typical methods of, of loaning money and paying back debt. There needs to be restoration and there needs to be reparations. Um, and so that means that money needs to be given without anything attached to it. So we can get off of the hamster wheel of every year, you have to do new work, you have to do new things, new things, new things, um, in order to just kind of make that deep investment. And so I think that as we're watching the polarization of our country, we're watching communities um, be split apart because of these systems, that now is the time to really reimagine them in new ways. And the reality is if any of us are still doing the same things now that we were doing pre-COVID, we're not doing it right. If we're still just interested in maintaining status quo methods of moving forward, then we're not moving forward. And we can't use words like innovation because we're not being innovative. And so that's going to mean taking chances. It's going to require taking risks. It's going to be require that there's not going to be the same levels of outcomes or roadmap that we're used to because we're going to have to move forward on uncharted territory. And so I'm hopeful that with our intention in place, with holding the intention of really trying to reimagine an equitable, just society for all that we're going to get there, but it's going to require a new mindset. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, if any of the participants want to ask a question, please um, type it in the chat and I'll try to catch it. Um, we, we just have a few minutes uh, left. And I think, you know, as, so as a funder, um, and and there are funders, funder participants. Um, you know, we are coming to a table that we asked to, to come to, you know, through various routes. Um, and that table has already been set. Um, there are tables that have traditions, practices, processes, procedures, and things that are not necessarily grounded in community. Even for myself, that's something I need to think about. I was born and raised here and on Denial land, which I didn't know actually until I was, um, out of high school, which is really just a horrible thing, but there's been a wonderful renaissance. And so that's very much more a part of what, what's happening now, at least in the Anchorage area. Um, but what is it that you would all say to people who are at the table? So some of us are taking the more traditional route. Um, you know, some of us, we're gatekeepers in each of our ways, but we are also um, people that are culture bearers, language bearers, um, indigenous people. We're all indigenous somewhere. We all have the ancestors whose shoulders we're on. We all have a vision for the future. And that's why we care about social capital. So is there something that you'd want to say to funders to consider when, you know, so to help us move from this idea that we're coming in to fix something or that we can heal something to where we can encourage and support those in the community, whatever community that is, um, to set the vision and direction, because that, that's really where the inspiration is. So I'm kind of opening that up, up to you, and maybe one of you could, um, could 
think about that and kind of respond. In here briefly, um, you know, I I want to be honest. I grapple with this notion of a seat at the table. I think we need new analogies. I I don't know how a group of people who sat at a table um, and you can pick whatever timeline you want to pick from. Where are you choosing the timeline of the 2,020 years of patriarchy and white supremacy? Or are we choosing the 400 plus years of the so-called United States of America, we know that there's been an oppressive class that sat at that table. So I don't really want to sit at that table. Uh, I think that we need a new model. We need a new infrastructure. We need a new system, a new way of thinking about things rather than just bringing new people to the same table. So I always struggle with that analogy. I know where you're going with that, right? I know that there is, um, and I'm using this word oppressive class. My 15-year-old my daughter actually just taught me that term because that's a term that she's been asked to use, not saying white um, or saying upper class or lower class. There's oppressive class and the oppressed class, right? Um, and so I think the oppressive class of the philanthropic and the private sector community needs to come off of the resources that are built on the blood, sweat, and tears of the oppressed, um, and and just to do that, and I and without without anything in return, just to make that investment to trust that those communities know exactly what needs to be done. And unfortunately, one of the reasons that they're not able to really get those projects off the ground goes back to that lack of capacity because of that funding model that I said is very one off in this. And so organizations aren't able to build the leverage to attract the national funding, to attract the next level of funding, to get to the next level, to take the time and the bandwidth to just think about and to dream and to imagine what impact, what what um, new methods and systems look like because so many of our communities have been functioning as first responders, have been functioning as firefighting. They're always filling, uh, um, putting out a crisis, right? And so there needs to just be time to reflect and not have any outcome, any outcome at the end of it and trusting that just that investment will bring the outcomes that we want. Amen. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can I just yeah, yeah, yeah. that? And okay, I just yeah, wanna, I'm going to be very super brief. I just want to uh, talk about, say uh, something that one of my sister friends, Sara Cardona of Teatro Dallas here uh, often says, she says, you know, uh, there's always a lot of big investment to scientists and researchers without question. They'll get millions of dollars to research this thing. And it doesn't necessarily have to come out with a cure or it's just a couple of, you know, and, and why can't we invest and have that same trust in the very people who have kept, you know, these communities alive? So I just wanted to put that there. Great. Um, anything for Chung or Inzo? I would love to say something, but it, yeah. Um, am I, I'm, I'm squinting on the microphone, but that's actually Stephen's microphone. I'm saying. So I am not muted. Uh, I, I feel as a traveler, because that's really what I've always been, um, the, the sort of, I'm sort of hovering slightly detached from uh, both whatever my own background might be and any of the issues. It's just, I don't know if it's uh, personality or whatever it is, and it's not like I don't want to have roots anywhere, but I just tend to keep to sort of want to look for the 360. And I don't want anybody to feel like left out of those or whatever. And I love it whenever anybody re, re, re innovates or, you know, recreates or turns upside down some kind of concept and makes me think again and feel again because I'm, a, I'm an improviser, I'm a jazz trumpet player. I mean, I don't want to play the same piece of music, I like do sight reading and then I put it away. I, I, I'm often too much into doing new things. So I really, really do honor the new uh, look that we need to have. Uh, I, I, I don't want to have a go at table class or any particular, you know, poor words. I mean, they're just words. They come from something, just like people come from something. We stand, every concept we try to do is sort of stand on that 
on the shoulder is standing on the shoulder of something else and we we, we sometimes uh, can perhaps um put it uh, have oh, how do i say it i don't i'm very careful uh I just want us to connect and so whenever whenever we do connect with truth and our own truth and our best intentions i think is is what what can move us forward in whatever direction we want to go i it strikes me as uh, something that uh, I, I feel like we're trying to do is create slowly but surely and individually in our own communities uh, in a new kind of indigenous culture, we all wanting to become indigenous to the thing that we're doing because that's where we feel safe. That's where the language is known. It is common. We have commonalities. We have ways of doing things that everyone's behind. And we have uh, beautiful traditions and memories and rituals and ways of doing things that are 100% owned by or I don't know the percentage, but are fully owned by the participants. So whether the symbol for that is a table or a circle or whatever it is, it's definitely non-hierarchical and it's coming together and it's flexible. And I think it builds on the trust and it doesn't alienate anyone. And I will just hope that we look at each process that we do and we are seeking funds or when funders come to us, that we are the same people. We are in the same room already. And so there is... Um, just the need to have this gentle conversation, or it doesn't have to be gentle, but a conversation where we uh, really turn kind of almost every stone and see we, 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 we create new concepts together and that we listen to each other. And I think it, it comes down to things that we learned as good ways of behaving with each other as we were younger uh, as well. And I think that taking these sort of very basic values that we hear in cultures that have been around for a very long time and that we heard in our own indigenous. Again, I think it's having the faith and the trust to be very open and human in our interactions. Uh, it's, this seems to be the new the new way and and I just really welcome that, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there is a question um, that I want you to think about. I, there's a comment I wanna make. Um, someone asked if the panelists have thoughts about how they interpret the word indigenizing um, and, and sort of the ways that we're using indigenous um, in our conversation. Um, we are nearing the close. So I, I just wanna say thank you all. I think that um, artists and creative people who are connecting to kind of the heart of what they're doing and, and having that drive what they do really is the future. You know, that those are the things that are going to help our community, um, you know, whether it's, um, you know, in a way kind of weaving this fabric, you know, of connections and trust and community making and kind of tying the past to the future and kind of building that path to the future or um, Kwa Chung's um, analogy of, you know, kind of stomping the path through the snow so that um, it can be there um, and it gets stronger and stronger every time. And, and that path is really connection. Um, I think that there was something um, Zakia said I thought was really interesting about not compartmentalizing. You know, wherever you are, to not compartmentalize. Um, you know, you bring your full self to everything that you do. And I would hope that the, the biggest takeaway for um, the participants in social capital is that you also, each of you, is also needing to bring your full self to what you do, whether it's at a table, at a circle, um, whether you're, you know, it's with a hammer to, you know, knock down the house, whatever it is that your, your plan is ultimately and where, whatever you're doing. Um, that you bring your full self uh, and that there is infrastructure to invest in and that there are communities and people and energy and um, ideas to invest in and that that's what you look for not the kind of proven practice um, you know you really look for how you can support communities cutting their way through the path um, for each other and others um, we are at the end um, i love this conversation um, it's just been such a gift to talk with you all and be able to have this conversation. Um, I feel a little selfish about it. I get to ask whatever I want to ask. <laughs> so that's sort of my power in this position. Um, but um, as we close, is there anything that you'd want to say um, in response to the indigenizing um, or any kind of closing thing you want to say as people kind of are, are closing out? Um, so I open that up to you. Yeah, and everything. And it's not. It's <laughs> yeah, you know, in, 
being in the place, right? I'm I'm here in my homeland, and and when we woke up and we found ourselves as tenants in our own homes, right? Uh, we had to find a way to to uh, to maneuver and get through that, and and the, really instead of really molding and shaping into the ways that we felt that we, or thought that we had to, right? In this new in this new world, uh, that didn't work. We found ourselves in in in, in places and 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 situations in our culture and our social structures that have just been. Uh, just, just been just being destroyed. So our best way that we have been doing it is just going back to ourselves and going back to who we are. And and if that's indigenizing um, or decolonizing, uh, whatever it is, uh, that's what we as a community have found uh, works best for us and where we're now moving forward um, as a as a community in ways that we had never in the last uh, in the last hundred years. Yeah, and it strikes me that um, all of you, even if you're learning from your ancestors and that built you, you're 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 doing you, and no one can do that better. No, and there's really nothing more valuable you can offer the world. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we are at the end. Um, I thank you all. Um, that was great. I thank the participants for joining us. Um, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts for helping to put this together. Um, it's really been a pleasure. So thank you. Go forward. Don't compartmentalize, be integrated, be full, <laughs> and, and when we can get this done, we can all connect. Brianna. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.